Hey guys, this is Bill Hyland. Uh, it's been a little while since I made a video, but I'd like to, to share some information with you about a project I've been working on for the last year or so. Uh, it got a lot more involved than I thought. There was a lot more things to learn uh, than I anticipated, but uh, I'm pretty sure it'll be worth it when it's all done. And what this has to do with is uh, EVPs that are captured in a vacuum. Now, I, I know a lot of you have heard me talk about this before. Uh, but for those who haven't, I'm going to just kind of touch off on it just a little bit here before I get started. Uh, during the late 1970s, there were a series of experiments conducted um, that showed that at least some of the time that EVPs are electromagnetic in nature. And they come to this conclusion by placing a dynamic microphone in a bell jar and evacuating all the air, creating a vacuum. Uh, when you do this, uh, sound can't propagate because it needs air and it can't travel in a vacuum. Uh, and yet they still recorded EVPs with this dynamic microphone. Um, now, how a dynamic microphone is different than other microphones is uh, they convert sound into electrical energy by electromagnetism, which means, um, well, they fall into two different uh, categories, first of all. There's a moving coil and a ribbon microphone. And basically what happens is uh, there's a little copper coil that moves up and down in, inside of a capsule. And as it moves up and down, it creates current that is uh, changed over to a, uh, an analog signal that is then uh, gone to, through the cable and into the recording device. Um, so that's what kind of makes it just a little bit different than a regular uh, condenser microphone or electric microphone or anything like that. So... Um, they, they were able to record these EVPs, um, and what always bothered me was uh, they went through all this trouble to to find out that yes, okay, sometimes it is electromagnetic, but they never tried to identify any types of frequencies uh, that were involved in this. So my thought was that if you could identify what frequencies that these EVPs were collected in, it would be possible to broadcast uh, communications back to them in that same frequency but there was never any attempt to made to try to identify what those uh, what those ranges were um, I can only guess that back in that time technology uh, that would allow you to do that would be really expensive first of all if it was even available um, now it's available and it's it's not that expensive um, I actually uh, have a real-time frequency analyzer that um, that scans the frequencies real time uh, in two different bands. It'll it'll search through the 2.4 gigahertz band, which is uh, your Wi-Fi's, and those wavelengths are uh, about 12.5 centimeters or 125 million nanometers. Um, and it also will scan the UF, UHF frequencies uh, 240 to 960 uh, gigahertz, um, and those are the defunct television broadcasts, uh, microwave ovens running those frequencies, microwave, all kind of microwave devices, um, radio astronomy, mobile phones, wireless LAN, uh, Bluetooth, GPS, two-way radios, and it, the list goes on and on. And uh, those go from one meter, excuse me, 100 millimeters to one meter in length, uh, wavelength. Okay, now what we're looking at here is the display from the uh, device that's plugged into my laptop. Uh, as you can see, you can see the uh, the blue text that's popping up on the uh, the top of the screen, and those are the different frequency spikes that are being detected. Um, so I can look and watch real time what's going on, uh, and I can do this in both bands. Um, as I talked about earlier, the UHF and the uh, uh, the 4 gigahertz bands uh, and what this will allow me to do when I run this side by side with a voice recorder um, with a dynamic microphone is I'll be able to uh, see if there's any EVPs and during those EVPs were there any kind of anomalous spikes uh, now here is the screen uh, using the uh, the UHF bands um, you can see it's a little slower. Um, there's not quite as much activity going on. However, there there are some spikes, as you can see on here. So there are uh, still UHF devices that are broadcasting signals. 
Okay, now this is the uh, data log or function that I was talking about. I'll uh, do a recording real quick and bring up a chart. And we'll name this one test, uh, just for namesake. Um, we'll go up, we'll click the start button, and I'm going to speed this up here a little bit so we're not waiting forever. Uh, but anyway, what it's doing is, it, is this, it's scanning around um, 20 scans per minute, which is one every three seconds, obviously. Uh, and it's going through the frequencies uh, from the low end all the way up to the top. Uh, I can change those settings. I can have it scan in specific areas. Uh, in this particular case, it's the widest uh, scan that I can do uh, with this antenna. Uh, and once it's finished scanning here, I'll, I'll save the file over and, uh, and I'll bring it up in a chart for you uh, to take a look at the data and, uh, and how we can maybe use it. Um, now here's the Excel uh, sheet. Um, and this is a test file obviously and these are all the frequencies and all of the readings and all the data points for each one of those frequencies for the entire recording. Uh, now it's kind of hard to, to decipher what I'm looking at here unless you click on each box but I have a, a little uh, a little app here that I can run that displays it in like a heat map form or in a visual format is what it is. It's almost like a pie chart, just a little more uh, in depth. And basically what it does, it records the whole thing uh, and, and makes it a, a more visual type of, of uh, data log. So I can take a look and you can see the bright areas where the spikes are, like right here, down here's a few. Um, so it's just another way to to visually see the data that was recorded. Um, plus it has all the, the data figures uh, involved. Now here is a global map of all of the regions. As you can see there are 90 of them. Uh, spread across the planet. Now in the United States there are actually four regions. It's six, seven, eight, and Alaska I believe is number two. Now this is what's interesting. Here's a, a, a little database that I have access to from the FCC and it's a frequency allocation chart. And what's beautiful about this is once I identify a signal or a frequency, I can do a search for it to find out what devices that are registered with the FCC uh, broadcast in that range. Um, now here I'll do a search for 100 megahertz. And here it says in ITU number 8, which is the East Coast United States, uh, FM radio, TV broadcast, and aircraft communications. And if you scroll down the list, you can see every device that's registered with the FCC that broadcasts in that range, uh, which causes a problem, and I'll get to here in a little bit. But uh, every every single device is listed here, and if you just pick one and just double click on it, it tells you everything about this device. It tells you, like in, in this case, it's a, an FM transmitter, but it tells you the applicant's information, their contact information, what type of equipment it is, uh, all of the test results, and everything, photographs of the devices themselves, all the information about that device is listed, which is which is a really uh, nice little resource to have. Okay, so back to the uh, frequency range problem that I, I talked about a few seconds ago. Um, suppose I were running this device alongside of a voice recorder, and I recorded an EVP. And at the exact same time, there was a frequency spike at 123.6 gigahertz. Now, when I go to the database and I do a search for 123.6 gigahertz, there's nothing that's going to come up that's specific to that exact frequency. Everything that is recorded with the FCC site broadcasts within ranges. There's nothing exactly 123.6. It's going to be 120 to 130 or you know 98 to 500 there's nothing it's going to be specific so that's a problem um, so the only thing I can do to eliminate all of the frequencies 
that are known is to build a radio or an RF shielded uh, cage. Uh, some people use the term loosely, uh, Faraday cage, whatever, but um, I need to build a cage that blocks all radio frequency, which is, which is simple enough to do. Um, and here's a picture of one. But once all of the RF uh, frequencies are eliminated, and I have these devices inside of this, this cage, and I'm able to detect a specific frequency, say 123.6, then I can use a frequency generator uh, to generate frequencies in those ranges that, that I can even convert audio files to those frequencies and broadcast. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to identify the sources um, and isolate, you know, a, in a small window where at least I have a starting point so I can identify where these frequencies are coming from. So uh, the hard part now is I have to devise uh, processes and procedures to start performing these tests but the uh, the hardware is in place the software is in place um, everything's put together now I just have to formulate a plan and I will keep you all updated on that